In the early years of the Cold War, America's biggest problem was not Soviet military might, but the appalling lack of information about what was going on behind the Iron Curtain. The tragedy of Pearl Harbor showed the government that the lack of information about enemies can have devastating consequences, and as you'll see in the course of this episode, they were willing to do the impossible to avoid another such situation. Spying on the Soviets was extremely difficult. At that time, the CIA was just a fledgling organization, while the KGB already had extensive experience in espionage and counterintelligence. Sadly, a CIA agent would be more likely to leave Moscow in a bag than with some useful information for Washington. Then the agency understood there was no point in trying to beat the Soviets at their own game. To win that war, they needed to change the very game and make them fight in a completely new scenario. The KGB was hands down the best spy agency in the world. But the U.S. also had its strong suit technology, particularly aeronautical technology. So instead of continuing to play and lose in the traditional spy game, the CIA, together with the Lockheed Corporation Skunk Works Division, decided to mix espionage techniques with highly advanced aerospace technology and created the world's first spy plane. Well, we already know that it was almost impossible to pass in front of a military installation in Moscow holding a camera without getting shot, or worse. So the Skunk Works team, led by genius Clarence Kelly Johnson, decided they were going to take these pictures in style. Using advanced optical equipment, the plane would photograph enemy installations at 21,000 meters above sea level. This distance was not chosen at random. 21,000 meters high was 1,800 meters above the limit of Soviet radar accuracy and almost 8,000 meters higher than the MiG-17 operating limit, the most advanced interceptor aircraft the Soviets had at the time. Those 8,000 meters were also enough to stay out of range of any air-to-air -air missile fired by those MiGs. A necessary precaution, since the spy plane would fly at a lower speed than the fighters of the time. It looked like a huge glider. The new plane was 19 meters long and 31 meters wide. All in black, to increase its stealth and equipped with a camera that took photos with a resolution superior to Google Earth. The final product could reach 24,000 meters height and fly at about 1,000 kilometers per hour. Dubbed U-2, the new spy plane was a relief for U.S. authorities as they could now photograph all Soviet military installations and know their exact location, size, and operational capability. Especially when it comes to nuclear missiles, the worst fear of any nation at war. Nicknamed the Dragon Lady, the flying spy proved to be a success and managed to fulfill its missions to perfection until 1960 when the first unit was shot down by a surface-to-air missile in the middle of Soviet territory. But Lockheed engineers knew the spy plane's invulnerability was temporary and that the Soviets would soon get missile systems capable of shooting it down and continued to work day and night on what would be the U-2's replacement and the ultimate spy plane. Engineers kept reaching higher and higher levels. And after the Dragon Lady, now it was the turn of the Archangel Project, a series of planes that would be even more stealthy and faster than the U-2. The first member of the family was the A-12, also known as the Oxcar, followed by its militarized version, the YF-12, capable of firing AM-74 Falcon missiles. But both projects were short-lived. Although these last two projects were little used, the technologies created during their development were vital to give life to the one which, in my humble opinion, is the most beautiful and impressive aircraft ever created by mankind. The SR-71, nicknamed Blackbird, is the result of decades of study and work by the greatest minds behind American aeronautics. It was simply the pinnacle of aerospace technology for over 30 years and even today is recognized as a legend among engineers, pilots, and aircraft lovers. Starting with the design, it was made in delta shape, which greatly lowers the signature on enemy radars. The black color was also not by chance. In addition to being a stealthy color, the ink was made with a special compound to absorb radar waves. The double inward-facing impenage was also designed to reflect radar waves up into the sky, rather than down, back to enemy receivers. The pressurized cockpit, now with space for a crew of two, one pilot, and one surveillance systems operator, was right at the front of the aircraft, away from the powerful Pratt and Whitney J-58 engines, which were in the wings, near the rear. 
And when I say powerful, I mean engines capable of flying at three times the speed of sound, about 3,500 kilometers per hour. The fuel was the famous JP-7, a synthetic compound with an extremely high boiling point, which allowed Skunk Works engineers to use it to cool different parts of the aircraft without worrying about fires or explosions. An effective cooling system was a must, mainly because flying at absurd speeds creates huge friction in the fuselage and consecutively very high temperatures capable of killing any human being inside. But of course, the engineers from Skunk Works found a solution. The cockpit had a powerful cooling system, but even then, temperatures reached 60 degrees Celsius. The pilots also wore special suits, similar to those of astronauts, which ensured even more protection against high temperatures and lack of oxygen. The cockpit windows and the camera responsible for the images were exposed to temperatures above 400 Celsius, and to avoid cracks and image distortion, were coated with a special glass made of quartz. Even the soldering had to be done with a special technique, and in this case, they chose one that used sound frequencies to ensure there would be no cracks in the solder. The fuselage was also made in an unprecedented way. Instead of conventional materials, the engineers chose to use titanium, an extremely rare metal, lighter and more resistant to temperature changes. This is a much needed quality in an airplane that flies at more than three times the speed of sound. But the problem was that the biggest titanium producer in the world was the very nation the Black Bird was supposed to spy on, the Soviet Union. So the CIA, using its expertise, used several shell companies to buy the titanium directly from the USSR, which never suspected it was helping to build the same aircraft it would spend decades trying to take down. Actually, the CIA used a shell company, which bought the material from another shell company, and so on until it was impossible to trace the titanium or the buyers. According to records, the USSR never found out who was buying it or its purpose. Getting titanium from the Soviet Union was vital to building the SR-71. Without it, the project really couldn't have been completed, and the reason is explained by physics. When exposed to heat, all materials tend to expand and swell, and the unique properties of titanium were really a key point to completing the fuselage. The issue of material expansion was so critical that the Blackbird had to be built in a way that on purpose allowed fuel to leak day and night. The fuel tank and the other components were built with a certain spacing that took into account the expansion of the structure at high temperatures. If the engineers hadn't made the plane with these small gaps, it would end up cracking due to the expansion and would fall apart midair. That's one of the characteristics that make the Blackbird unique and even more impressive. Its speed limit was not due to the technical capabilities of the engines, but to the limit of heat tolerated by humans, internal components, and structure. If those giant engines accelerated to the limit, the pilots would surely die from the heat, then the aircraft structure would simply melt down, crack and fall apart. Back to the fuel leak, whenever the SR-71 went on a mission, a second refueling was needed, carried out in mid-air with an auxiliary plane. Then finally, the fuel tank was filled to the limit, and as soon as the plane reached the ideal height and supersonic speeds, the heat would make the tank expand and close every gap, finally ending the leaking. And since we're talking about height, this plane surpassed the U-2 in that regard too. The maximum altitude the Blackbird used to operate was 24,000 meters high. This is so high that there was no way for pilots to orient themselves by landmarks on Earth, and no, it was the 60s, so no GPS. In this case, it was necessary to create a special guidance system based on the stars, that is, a star map. It was called by the acronym ANS, the Astro Inertial Navigation System, Pilots say the plane sensors were so powerful that the system worked while the plane was still on the ground and during the daytime with zero visible stars. Spy systems have also been radically improved. Now, in a single mission, pilots were able to gather visual data using a camera capable of taking a high-resolution photo of a license plate 24 kilometers down. In addition to recording electronic, radar, and infrared data, the complete package. A huge upgrade, since in the past, each mission used to make only one of these recordings at a time, which saved time, money, and decreased the chances of being shot down by the enemy. But even mentioning the last one is kinda ridiculous. That's because, during the Blackbird's nearly three decades of service, no aircraft was shot down by the enemy, not even one. There were 15 accidents that caused crashes, but the Soviets never managed to take down an S or 71 unit. Not even the mighty MiG-31, the most advanced Soviet fighter at the time could. 
The Blackbird used to fly so high that missiles tended to use up almost all fuel just to get close to it, and when a missile actually managed to lock onto the plane, the pilot just needed to accelerate more. Several pilots reported they saw missiles simply exploding in the air from miles away. The aircraft was virtually untouchable. And finally, after more than 1,000 missions and speed records that remain unbeatable to this day, in 1990, the Congress chose to retire the Blackbird and transfer the funds to other projects such as UAV development and the B-2 Spirit Stealth Bomber Project. There is a lot of speculation about the reasons for this retirement. Some say the advance of Soviet missile systems made Americans retire it before it was shot down, while others say that spy satellites made the plane obsolete. But the only reason that makes sense, at least to me, was the fall of the Soviet Union. In 1990, the American government already knew that its terrible enemy of the past was already staggering, one step away from falling, and wouldn't make sense to maintain a very expensive project that had the sole purpose of spying on this defeated enemy. But regardless of the reason, the S-71 Blackbird served the nation impeccably, went down in history as one of the most impressive planes to date, was one of the main tools for the defeat of the USSR, and also immortalized Kelly Johnson among the most important and influent aircraft engineers in history.